so this is the, the basic notion seminar and so what I will do today is to uh, tell you some basic notions of projective geometry, algebraic geometry. So I will not assume that, that you know anything about algebraic geometry, but I would like to, um, to motivate uh, the, the, this, the, this basic notions by uh, connecting it to a problem, uh, to an applied problem of the geometry of tensors. So let me start by uh, defining the, uh, the tensors I'm interested in. So I will in general fix a K uh, complex vector spaces, and I consider the, the tensor product of these vector spaces. So this is again a vector a complex vector space W, and each uh, so this 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 vector space uh, is generated by um, by vectors that we call indecomposable. So I don't think this is. Uh I can just show these are the what we call these the indecomposable uh, vectors. So these are just tensor products of vectors in the in the VIs. And in general, an element of this this tensor product is um, this vector space is just a sum of uh, indecomposable tensors. So the 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 minimum number of uh, summons in such a decomposition is called the rank of the tensor. So we have this vector space and every vector um, has a rank, which is the minimal number of elements that you, and the composable elements that you need to write it as a sum uh, of, of say primitive or indecomposable tensors. So this is, uh, so this is, uh, these are, the, this is our easy definitions. And so again, let me keep them here. So there are, so in the, the, the people that study the composition of tensors, they're interested in several questions. So let me mention just some problems that are important in applications. So given, if you're given a tensor, how can you compute the rank of this tensor? Minimum, meaning the minimum number of, uh, in the composable tensor so that you can write it in, in this form. And in general, uh, what is the generic value of the rank? Meaning if you pick a random element in this vector space, what will be its rank? And well, well other important questions is when is this decomposition unique? And how to actually find, if you give me a, a, a vector if, you're given, if you give me a vector, how can I compute uh, a minimum decomposition of this sort? So these are problems that people uh, study, and they are very important for applications. So I would like to mention some applications of the composition of tensors. So they, uh, they are very important for computability and, co and complexity of algorithms, uh, algebraic statistics, phylogenetics, signal processing, and many other applications. So I just listed a few. And what I want to do today is to motivate the definition on some very, some very classical objects in algebraic geometry using the problem of tensor decomposition. So I will start by, so I will concentrate in this problem, what is the generic rank of a vector, of a, of a, uh, <coughs> of a tensor. So I, I, we are going to consider these questions for some, some types of, uh, so, so, certain vector spaces like this. So we want to know the generic rank and I will explain how this can be important for computability and complexity of algorithms. So this is the goal. So I will start with the application or the problem of the, the, the speci some specific problem on complexity of algorithms. Uh, and then we're going to see how, how ranks come by and then Finally, we will introduce the projective varieties that are associated to this problem. Okay, so this is a very simple problem, which is matrix multiplication. So if you have two matrix, A, B, C, D, and E, F, G, H, and you want to compute the product of these matrices, so we learned this in, in high school. So this is the usual algorithm that we use to compute the product of these two matrices. So if you look at this, um, you notice that you ha we have to do to, to compute the product of two general matrices, we have to perform eight multiplications. So these are uh, listed here. And of course, when you 
uh, increase the, the, the size of the matrix, then you will increase the number of multiplications needed. And, and it turns out that this is, this is very costly computationally to multiply matrices in this form. And then you can ask, well, maybe is there another algorithm that I can use to multiply, say, two by two matrices using less multiplications, even if I have to use um, more additions? So additions are sort of cheap computationally, but multiplications are expensive. And as it turns out, there, there, are, there are other algorithms to multiply matrices. And there is this uh, called Strassen's algorithm. Uh, which I have put here, and this is why I could not improvise this uh, on the blackboard. Um, so you have to trust me that, so there are some, okay, so these are, this is, so there are some rules that you do. Um, so we have, we want to compute this matrix here, which is the multiplication of these two. And as it turns out, there is stress and algorithms tell you how to do this just performing. So here you're performing seven multiplications and then by performing the seven multiplications, then you can just perform some additions and subtra some subtractions to, inf to obtain uh, the product of the matrix. So the, the, the <coughs> what I want to, you to keep in mind is that there is, an, there is a way to multiply two by two matrices using only seven multi scalar multiplications. And what I want to explain to you today is, so actually Strassen's got to this algorithm by trying to prove that you need eight multiplications to multiply these two matrices. And then when he was trying to prove it, he ended up uh, running into this algorithm. And what I want to explain to you today is why maybe you should already guess that there could be an algorithm only with seven multiplications. So for that, now I will introduce uh, tensors and then we're going to, uh, to see how to interpret this problem from the point of view of tensor decomposition. Okay, so um, I will start with, a, I will consider my space of two by two matrices, so with, with complex entries. So this is a, a, vector a complex vector space of dimension four. Uh, and I want to under, so I want, I want to understand, to, so uh, my goal is to find al an algorithm, say, to compute multiplication. So I, con I consider this, uh, this linear map from the tensor product V, tensor V to V, that associates um, to, two ma to, to a pair of matrices, sorry, AB, uh, it's, it's uh, multiplication A dot B, A, A multiplied with B. So we can view uh, such, such an operation as a tensor in this uh, tensor product. So this is one way to, in to interpret the multiplication of two matrices as a tensor. And let me make this very explicit. So let me tell you how if you, ha if you give me an element, in uh, an indecomposable element in this vector space, so this means that you give me, say, uh, a, uh, <coughs> a linear functional alpha, a linear functional beta, and a matrix uh, C, then I can compute, the f I can define the following linear map. So you apply it to A, B, and you just compute alpha in A, beta in B, and then this is, so these are numbers, these are complex numbers, you multiply them, and then you multiply by the matrix C. So this is uh, very explicitly how, from, a, from an, a tensor here, this, a tensor here defines, in, in the composable tensor, defines um, uh, um, an operation in, in this way. And now what we want to do is to understand, so if you give me now the, if you, if you are considering now the multiplication tensor, it can be written for some R, for some rank, it can be written as a sum of indecomposable tensors of this form. And the question is, what is the rank of T? And roughly speaking, uh, the rank of the multiplication tensor T is exactly the number of scalar multiplications that one needs to execute it computationally, the, the, the minimal number that one needs to compute it um, using, R scal using scalar multiplications. So, the, 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 so now 
we are interested in understanding this and now what I want to explain is uh, so what is the generic value of uh, of the rank of a tensor in this particular vector space and using algebraic geometry what we will see is that this generic value of the rank of a tensor in this vector space is precisely seven so this could tell you uh, a priori that well maybe then there could be an algorithm that requires only seven multiplication to multiply two by two matrices so now um, so now we are, we so we passed from the problem of multiplying matrices to the problem of tensor decomposition and now I want to introduce uh, algebraic varieties in context with this problem so let me start with a very general definition of, uh, the, of projective space. So we, I will define the projective space of dimension n. So this is going to be the, uh, the one-dimensional linear subspaces of C to the n plus 1. So we consider the vector space of dimension n plus 1 minus the origin, and we identify all the vectors that lie on the same line through the origin. So this is how we define uh, projective space and we so a point any point and any point in CN plus 1 different than 0 gives a point in the projective space and we denote this point in this way so this is what we call the coordinate the projective coordinates of the point and notice that this is not uh, uniquely defined so whenever you have a point that is given by uh, these coordinates I could multiply everything by lambda and it still corresponds to the same point Okay, so these are, these are the projective space, and inside the projective space, we consider the projective varieties. So these are algebraic varieties, so these are going to be sub-varieties of the projective space, subsets of the projective space that are defined by zeros of polynomials. But now, there's only one subtotal T, which is, well, if you are in CN, you can define an algebraic variety as the zero locus of polynomials. But now we are in the projective space, so instead of considering zero locus of polynomials, it doesn't make sense because, you know, if maybe you have a polynomial that vanishes on these points, but if you multiply everything by lambda, it should be the same point, but it doesn't vanish anymore. So this is in general, it's possible. But what we do is instead of taking uh, uh, just uh, polynomials, we take homogeneous polynomials, sorry, this should be a just a polynomial ring. Uh, so we take homogeneous polynomials, and the good thing about homogeneous polynomials is that if, if it vanishes on some vector, and you multiply this vector by some lambda, still, it still vanishes. So this now becomes well-defined, so if I take, uh, if I fix this homogeneous polynomials and consider all the points in the projective space, uh, for which this, this polynomial vanishes at this point, then this gives me what we call a projective variety, an algebraic variety. Okay, and, um, and in general, so I define this, uh, you know, as just the, the, the quotient of Cn, my, Cn plus 1 minus the origin by this equivalence relation, but in general I can do it more abstractly for any vector space. So if I have any vector space W, I can consider the projective space of W, this is going to be just the space of lines through the origin or dimension one linear subspaces, so this is just uh, W minus the origin uh, modulo the equivalence relation that, that, that uh, identifies vectors that are multiple of one another. Okay, so these are projective spaces, these are projective varieties, and now let's go back to the, our problem, you know, complex, uh, computing the complexity of matrix multiplication. So let me remind you then, okay, we had this tensor, the multiplication of two matrix could be interpreted as a certain tensor in this tensor product, in this vector space. In this case, uh, v and v dual are both isomorphic to C fourth. So this tensor product has dimension 64, 4 by times 4 times 4. And so the projective space is going to be a projective space of dimension 63, always one less. So we have now a point, so this tensor corresponding to mo matrix multiplication corresponds to a point in a projective space. And now what I'm going to do is so we want to compute the, t the, the rank of this tensor. So what first thing I'm going to do is to define 
an algebraic variety, a projective variety inside this projective space corresponding to tensors of rank one, meaning in the composable tensor. So this is very easy to do. So I consider here the product of this three projective space, so this is P3 times P3 times P3, goes to P63, taking, so you take uh, points corresponding to this to these vectors and then you just associate the tensor product. So this, so the, the important thing that, I, that I'm not um, explaining here is that it turns out that if you look at the image of this map, so this is called the Segre uh, embedding, so the image of the Segre embedding turns out to be an algebraic variety, a projective variety, and actually one knows exactly what are the equations, the, the, the homogeneous polynomials that define this projective variety inside P63. Uh, so this is a, so we have a projective variety inside this big projective space, um, which, uh, which corresponds to the tensors that, are, that have rank one. So this, is, this should be thought of as the space of all tensors, and now, uh, inside the space, we have a smaller variety of dimension uh, 3 plus 3 plus 3 of dimension 9, corresponding to the decomposable tensors. Now, what about the ones, the tensors of rank 2? How can we define them from this point of view? Well, if you have a, a tensor of rank 2, that means that it can be written as the sum of two in the composable tensors. So this is from the point of view of tensor decomposition. Now, if you view it from the point of view of algebraic geometry, what this is saying is that T belongs to the line in the projective space that joins these two points. And then one can go further if you look then of a tensor of rank R, this is going to be in the R minus one plane spanned by R points of X. Okay, so given this, let me then define something in general. So if you have any, uh, well here there's this, this non-degenerate just means that it's not contained in any linear subspace, but it does, it's not so important. Um, so we have a, a projective variety of, say, of dimension n. Then we can define this d secant variety of x in the following way. So I take for any d points in x, I consider this, well, maybe I should take here for d general points in x. I can take the linear subspace spanned by these d points. So this is a p d minus 1 if these points are general. So I take the union of all these p d minus 1s, and then I take, I take the closure. So this is what we call the d secant variety of x. And so what happens, so we have the, the, the second, so the, the, for d equals 2, this is just the union of all, the closure of the union of all the lines that are secant to x and so on. And now we can, we, we will want to, in, to understand, and it will be clear why, we want to understand what is the dimension of this, of this variety. So we have a very natural candidate, which is called the expected dimension, that is very easy to compute. So what are we doing here? We are taking d points of x. So x has dimension n. So for each point of the point, so for each choice of a point, that means that we get a, a n-dimensional family of, of, of choices. So we have d of them, so this is d times n. And for each choice of these d points, we, we are taking a, a pd minus 1. So this is dn plus d minus 1. So this is the expected dimension of this variety. Um, so in, well, it's expected dimension, but it, in general, it may not be exactly, we are going to see an example when this is, is not, does not coincide with, the, with the, the, the correct dimension of the, of the variety. But at least, no, no, this is sort of easy to compute. And well, of course, this is this is this if this is less than n. So in fact, the right the right formula is that, that the expected dimension is the minimum between this number and the dimension of the ambient space. Okay, 
So now let's go back to our problem. Again, we had this tensor T that corresponded to the multiplication of two two by two matrices. Um, and we considered the SAGRA embedding. So this is the this is uh, embedding this uh, product of projective spaces as a certain variety corresponding to rank one tensors in this big vector space. So this is our X. And the dimension of X is 3 plus 3 plus 3, 9. In this case, and then we are going to consider the secant varieties of this X. So the expected dimension of the secant variety of X is given by this minimum. And in this specific case, uh, it is known that the dimension of the expected, the, the, the expected dimension of the secant variety is in fact the dimension of the secant variety. So if one computes the dimensions using this formula, well, you get that the dimension of the secant variety is, is, is 19, the third secant 29, and so on, until you fill out the whole space taking the seventh secant variety. So this is what I said before. So this, what this is saying is if you pick a generic point inside this P63, meaning if you pick a generic tensor in, this, uh, in the tensor product of these spaces, its rank will be precisely seven because this is what fills out the whole space. So, thi so this is why one maybe should have as expected that there could be an algorithm for multiplying two by two matrices uh, making use only of seven multiplications. So, okay, so this is it. This is how I wanted to, uh, to motivate this uh, <coughs> This, uh, this notions. And I would like now to, um, yeah, so this is what I said, the conclusion is that the rank, the generic rank is seven. Now I would like to um, maybe discuss some other very interesting example. Uh, we are going to consider the following space. So we, are, we start with the vector space uh, C3. And inside this vector space, I will consider the, well, I take the tensor product. So in this case, if you're just taking a tensor product of the same space, you can view this as a three by three matrices. So this is V tensor. V can be interpreted as the, the, the C vector space of three by three matrices. But I will not be interested in considering all possible tensors in V tensor V. For some reason, well, depending on the problem that I'm working in, I am interested in considering only the uh, symmetric matrices. So this is what we call the, the second symmetric product of, of V. So these are just the symmetric tensors here. So in terms of, in, in terms of matrices, these are only the, uh, the three by three uh, symmetric matrices. So this is the space that I'm interested in. And again, I want to compute what is the, the generic rank of uh, a symmetric tensor. And again, we are going to interpret this from the point of view of algebraic geometry. So again, I have a projective variety parametrizing rank one tensor. So this is very, um, So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm viewing uh, a vector. So I'm taking a vector v in C3. So I view this as you know a column vector. And if I consider v uh, dot v transpose, this is a symmetric um, three by three matrix of rank one. So in this case, the rank of the matrix is precisely uh, the, the, the rank of, uh, as a tensor. So in this case, we see that, so this is uh, a symmetric matrix of rank one. And if I, and I, con and I can consider then this map that takes, the, uh, takes a vector to this symmetric matrix. Again, the image of this map, so this is called the Veronese map. It's also a, a very classical, uh, objects in, in projective geometry. So if I take consider the image of this map, again, this is a projective variety in P5. So the symmetric, so you see that the two by two, the 
symmetric 3x3 three three matrix is form a vector space of dimension 6. When I consider the projective space, so this becomes a P5, and inside this P5, so this is just a P2, right? So V has dimension 3, so this is a P2. So the, the Veronese map is something that goes from P2 to P5, take the call point corresponding to, to a vector V, to the, mate, to the point corresponding to the matrix V times V transpose. OK, so again, this is a projective variety. One can, I can tell, well, it's, it's easy to write down, actually, the equations, the homogeneous polynomials that define this equation in P5. And it has dimension 2 because this is just, uh, this is just an embedding of P2 inside P5. OK, now let's consider the secant varieties to x. So if you compute the expected dimension of the second the secant variety of x, this is already 5. So one, one would expect that the secant variety to this, this is called the Veronese surface, is already the, 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 the projective space uh, P5. But it turns out that this is not, this is not true. So let's see. So if you have an element in the, in the second secant variety of x, so what does that mean? That should mean that it can be written as a sum of two rank one tensors. So it should be written as a sum of two symmetric matrices of rank one. But see, if you add two symmetric matrices of rank one, you get something of rank at most two. So being in the second variety of x, second second variety of x is equivalent for of having rank at most two. So having rank at most two is exactly saying that the determinant of the matrix van vanishes. So the determinant of, of the matrix M is just a polynomial, a homogeneous polynomial in the coordinates of the, of the point corresponding to the matrix. So this is what we call a hypersurface in the projective space is cut out by only one equation. And when you define a projective variety just by using one equation, its dimension, uh, sorry, its dimension, um, right, so this is what I'm saying. So this is the, the, pro the projective variety defining by the determinant. And that means that the dimension ha is going to be one less than the projective space. When you cut out by one equation, the dimension drops by one. So you see that the, uh, the, the actual dimension is, is smaller than the expected dimension. So that does happen sometimes that the, exception, the expected dimension is not the, the actual dimension. So it is actually uh, a, a very difficult problem in general to, to compute the actual dimension of these secant varieties. Um, Okay, but see, okay, this is, a, this is a, a basic notion seminar, so also I would like to not only, so I use them to define, uh, to sort of motivate the definition of projective varieties, but I also want to explain to you why we got our computations wrong in this case. So why did we compute that the expected dimension is five, and why is it not five, but only four? So let me, um, so for that, I will have to tell you a little bit more about this Veronese embedding that I defined here. So the first, so we have this P2. So let me again. So this is our map. So we have our P2 that, by this map, uh, V is sent to a certain variety inside P5. Our variety X. And I think there's, on, there's only one, uh, one geometric aspect that you must uh, understand in order to understand why we got the dimension count wrong in this case. So if you take a line in P2, what is the image by the Veronese map? So here, the definition is here. So if I take a line, so that means that I am taking a vector and I'm varying its coefficient linearly, when I compute the corresponding point in P5, I am going to get, so I'm taking V dot V. So this is going to be uh, not, so a line here is going to be sent to something of degree 2. 
So a line is always sent to a conic. So this Veronese map takes lines to conics. And this is enough to understand why we got the dimension count wrong. So let's try to understand this. So let's suppose that I pick the point, uh, I point P in the second secant variety of X. So let me erase this, uh, this, call, this for, the mo for a moment. So what does this mean? This means that it lies, if I take a general point there, it lies on a secant line to x. So this is the definition of the secant variety. Now, so we have these two points here that determine the line passing through P. So in P2, then they will correspond to certain two points here. And I can consider the line joining these two points. Now, if I take the image of this line, this is what we've just seen. They, they are mapped to a certain conic through these two points. But now, let's look at this picture. So a conic determines a plane. So this conic here is contained in, determines a certain plane. That contains, of course, this line passing through P. So everything now is happening at this plane P. But now notice, if I take any other line in the, through this point containing in the plane, it will again meet the conic in two points. So a line in a plane, in a, in, so I'm, I'm working over the complex, so a line on, on, on a P2, on a plane, always meet a conic in two points. So see what we were, our, we got the wrong dimension because when we make that dimension estimate, we counted this point, uh, this point, uh, this point should be counted infinitely many times. So there is a one parameter family of secant lines that pass through this point. And so this is what is causing this dimension here, sorry, this dimension here to drop by one with respect to the expected dimension. So what I'm trying to, to illustrate here is that uh, the dimension, the expected dimension uh, being less, uh, the, uh, being bigger than the, the, the actual dimension. So this occurs for some geometric uh, reason. So in this case, the geometric reason is very easy to, to describe. Um, and, and there's a lot of questions in general on how, okay, so when is, the seek, when is the expected dimension not equal to the right dimension? And in this case, what is the, what is the geometry that is behind this? Okay, so let me just, um, uh, state now a very general problem, uh, generalizing those that I have described. Uh, so let me, in general, I will start with, so this is, is going to be, this one is going to be a mix of the two examples that I explain. So I will fix some uh, complex vector spaces V1 up to Vk, each one of dimension and i. And let me, for simplicity, let me just order them in increasing dimension. And for each one of those, I consider the, uh, the space of symmetric tensors of order D in VI. So this is a tens so this is the subspace of this tensor product corresponding to symmetric tensors. And now I take the symmetric product of all these things. So this is a mix of the two uh, types of tensors that I described. Um, I'm, I'm not, uh, so there is another important type of tensor, which is the anti-symmetric tensor. And again, the anti-symmetric tensor also correspond to a very important projective variety. So these are what we call the Grassmannian variety. So you may have heard of Grassmannians. They appear exactly as uh, the, the projective variety corresponding to uh, indecomposable anti-symmetric tensors. But, but for, for, for this talk, I just want to concentrate on so this, this sort of mixed product of symmetrics. So this is symmetric in, in, in different pieces. So now I consider this, this problem. Um, 
And again, I have a projective variety, so I can take, so in this, in this projective space, I can consider uh, all the, the indecomposable, or in other words, the rank one tensors. So these are exactly parametrized by this product. So if I take uh, points in this vector space, in this projective spaces corresponding to these vectors, I take their symmetric power uh, vi to the di and they take this tensor product. So this is a rank one tensor in this space. And again, this is a projective variety, so this is a, a, a mixed situation. So this, this variety is called the Segre Veronese variety. So this is a Segre Veronese embedding. And so again, this is a, this is a projective variety and the problem that, so this is, a, this is an open problem in general, is when is the expected dimension equal to the actual dimension? So this is, a, so this is the problem that, uh, this is a, a problem that I have uh, um, been investigating. And, uh, and uh, in this generality, this, it's, it's very much open, so very few, very, very, Little is known, so I will tell you now what is known uh, for this problem. So again, let me just, so I'm just repeating the notation here. So I fix some vector space of dimension and I, I order them by the dimension. I consider this space of, uh, of, of tensors that are symmetric in each piece of this. So this is a, this, uh, this tensor product. I consider the Segre Veronese variety in this projective space, which is the variety corresponding to rank one tensors, and I want to understand when is the expected dimension equal to, to, to the actual dimension of the secant variety. So this problem basically, if I can solve this problem, basically I'm telling you uh, what is the generic tensor for every space, the, ge the generic rank or the, the rank of the generic vector in any tensor uh, space like this. So the problem of computing the, the, the rank of a generic tensor in a certain of a certain type uh, is rephrased by when computing the dimension of a certain uh, projective variety. Okay, so for, for this problem, let me tell you uh, what is known. So the first case when k equals one, so k equals one means that I'm just considering the, just one factor, so I'm looking at the symmetric tensors of, 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 some, of some order, of, some, of, of a vector space. So in this case I already showed you an example here when the expected dimension is not equal to the, to the actual dimension, and in this case, these are class, so this, this problem is completely solved. So Alexander and, so this is a very important paper. Uh, Alexander and Hirschowitz show in 1995, they have a list. So in the case of uh, the, 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 when the, uh, the degree is true, as in this case, this is always what we call uh, defective. So uh, uh, we say that the variety is defective when the secant is not, does not have the expected dimension. So in the degree true, this is always defective. And then ex except for this, the degree true cases, there are four cases that they list and that's it. All the other cases, the expected dimension equals the, um, the, the actual dimension. So, but this is for, so this is completely solved, the problem is completely solved when you have one factor. Now, if you have more factor, then you just have, the known results are some very special cases with few factors. So for instance, only two factors and of dimension, one of them having dimension two, or some, some very, very, um, very few cases are known. Uh, and the first general result, you know, not just when you don't really um, bound the number of factors when you just allow anything, the first uh, general result was given in 2003. And uh, so, Jeramide and, and Gimigliano showed that the expected dimension is equal to the actual dimension whenever for this type of, of, of tensor products, so this, this, this type of tensors, uh, whenever S 
is less or equal than n1. n1 is the smaller dimension here. Uh, so this is the so this was the, the, the only general result for any number of factors that was, was known until recently. And then let me just uh, state uh, a theorem that I proved recently with Alex Massarenti and Ricky Richte. Uh, so we improved this bound by showing that the expected dimension is equal to the actual dimension of the second variety. So, we, so here this was a, a bound that was you know, linear on, on, on N1. And here, and this had, did not take into account the degrees of the, um, of the symmetric powers here. So here we took these degrees into, into account by adding this, uh, this exponent here. And, 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 and so far, this is the, the, the best general result for this problem taken in general. Of course, for, for if you look at fewer cases of, of certain types, then you may have better results. But for general, general results, I think this is, as far as I know, uh, th this is the best one so far. And so I, I, I don't want to explain to you the proof, but uh, just by connecting to this, to this, let me just say that we, the proof is very geometric and we, we studied the osculating spaces. So here we were looking at, you know, in this, this, in this case, things were sort of very simple. Um, but, but for our proof, what we do is we do, we look at osculating spaces to these projective varieties and compute them explicitly and use them to understand the geometry um, of, the, of the secant varieties. So, so I, this is all I had to say. Thank you. It's uh, mysterious, right? Yes. Let me say how I can. Okay. So this is a. This is. Um, I don't expect that this is sharp or anything, but this was the way. This was the way our proof went. So this, the proof, um, had. So what we, what we, what we did is the following. Let me try just, just to, to give you an idea of what, what, what. So what was the the, the best method known? Uh, before we introduced this, uh, this approach by looking at osculating space, uh, we had to, one had to look, so you had this uh, variety, your variety X, uh, whose sequence you want to understand. And then there was a method for computing these this dimensions, which was to take, you know, you take general points in X and look at their tangent spaces and look at the linear space spanned by all these tangent spaces and project from it and then try to understand the fibers of the projection. So this was the known, the, the way that people usually approach this problem. So what we do is we, uh, we instead of considering, so the problem of this is that you need to consider many tangent spaces and, and things easily get out of control if you have too many tangent spaces, you cannot control what's going on. So what we do is instead of looking at the tangent space, we look at the bigger osculating space. And in such a way that we can, uh, so this osculating space has this property that if you, if you degenerate uh, these points to a single point, the image of the span of the tangent space is still going to be contained in this osculating space. And then we sort of apply the same, the same ideas. So this log 2 appears there because this is, in a sense, it, it, it contains information of how, how, how many tangent spaces we can deform to an osculating space at each time. And then, so we, we, if we can uh, say, let's assume that we can, um, we can degenerate three tangent spaces. Uh, let me see if we can, let's assume that we, we, in fact, we can degenerate exactly N1 tangent spaces to be contained still in a, in, in a suitable osculating space. 
And then again, we take n1 points in general position, take their osculating space, and then again, uh, def deform. And so this, we do it always by taking n1 of those. And then that's why that log 2 appears there, because this is sort of telling us how many times we can actually do this degeneration. I, maybe it was not. It's, it's, uh, it's, it, it, it appears technically in, in the degenerating process. The, the generating process. So, what about the Hilbert polynomial of x or the syzygies? Are they relevant here? Do they capture any of this, of the dimension of the secret space? Um, so, this is a good question. I don't. I don't know. I, yeah, I haven't. I haven't looked at them from this point of view. But this, uh, maybe they could tell you something. I really don't know. More questions? If not, let's then speak again.